I preached a couple of messages on blessing. I remember I preached not long ago about I am blessed. <laughs> we want to be blessed. And you know what? The greatest blessing of all is that I am saved. <laughs> I am born again. I am a child of the Most High God. I am washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. I have eternal life in me today. When I leave this world, when I leave this world, I am going to heaven. I am not going to hell. What a blessing. Glory to God. We will read for our text this morning from Matthew chapter 5. From verse number 1 to number 12. Matthew chapter 5. From verse 1 to verse 12. And I'm simply glad to see you all this morning as we are getting back to normal services. As it were. And I say glory to God. If you are there, say amen. Matthew chapter 5. I will quickly read down through this passage in English only. You can go on with me. The Yoruba people. And it's projected up there. For easy reading too. For easy reading. Matthew chapter 5. I start from verse 1. And seeing the multitude, he, that is Jesus, went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciple came unto him and he opened his mouth and taught them saying blessed are the poor in spirit for this is the kingdom of heaven blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness or they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemaker, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for this is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye, you, Children of God today. Blessed are ye. When men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely, for my sake, rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. Amen. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Father, bless your word. Amen. O oh Lord, speak to our spirit. Amen. Let us tap into your word and receive your blessing through your word and be blessed. Amen. Fill our spirit today. Amen. Feed our spirit with your word. Amen. And give us the grace to do your word. Amen. Our confidence is in you, Almighty God. Oh, yes. Help us, we pray. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. The passage we read this morning is considered part of the sermon on the mount that Jesus preached on the mount. Jesus preached a couple of messages. Jesus preached a couple of messages during his earthly ministry. This was the first of them. Now, uh, this is considered the greatest sermon in the world. The world's greatest sermon. 
One church put on their sign on the side of the road. When their pastor was about to preach from uh, this passage, Sermon on the Mount, and the sign on, their, on the roadside, on their signboard on the roadside, read, read like this. World's greatest sermon by Pastor Soso and So. World's greatest sermon. It was so to guide I want you to pick that right. Yes, and that is a bit confusing. To, because is that is the pastor going to preach the greatest sermon? Sermon, Iwasu. Iwasu la. Or it was referring to the sermon preached by Jesus Christ himself, Abu, which is the greatest. So, however, it is Jesus who preached the world's greatest sermon, not that pastor. A friend told another friend how he became a Christian. How he became a Christian. Right, he went to Christian's bookstore and asked for the sermon on demand by Jesus. And uh, the clerk at the bookstore told him that they did not have the book Sermon on the Mount, but that they did have New Testament and that he should show him and that he will show him where the Sermon on the Mount was in the New Testament. And so this man bought the New Testament and he began to read from Matthew chapter 5 to chapter 7. He was so moved by what he read that he read the whole New Testament. And later, he got saved. He got saved. You will find some great sermons in the Bible. Now, I'm still in the introduction to the Beatitudes I'm going to pray, but you need to understand the context where this passage we read this morning is. Peter preached a great sermon on the day of Pentecost, didn't he? 3,000 people got saved. What about that? And uh, I tell you, uh, Stephen preached a powerful, convicting message. Paul preached a lot of messages, notable in the Bible. But fittingly, it was the preaching of Jesus Christ that tops them all. He is the God of the world. And he is the word of God. And he has the perfect message for you. So when Jesus, after he was baptized, after he picked his disciples, the Bible says he went and he saw the people, a lot of people. Then he moved to the mountain top with his disciples with him. He called them. And of course, Hoda followed. And he sat on the mountain. I believe the people were a bit lower, like the pulpit place here in the church. I'm a bit higher than you all. Amen. Amen. So he was able to look down and he started preaching. So there are three uh, chapters that you will find the sermon on the mountain in. Sermon on the mount. That is Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 6 and Matthew chapter 7. 
But the Beatitudes I'm going to be preaching from for some weeks now is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 12 that we read this morning. And these are the first section of the Sermon on the Mount. This beatitude consists of nine blessings that were pronounced by Jesus Christ in this sermon. And each is like a proverb like. It is like a proverb. Proclamation with that narrative. Just a simple st statement, a simple sentence. And however, I want you to know that four of these blessings are uh, seen in Matthew chapter 5 is also noted in Luke chapter 6. Four of them. In Luke chapter 6, verses 20 to 22, Jesus said, Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. But if you look, read in the past uh, context of Luke chapter 6, he said he preached this one on the plain, not on the mountain. Right? So it was not the same setup. But it was the same message. Let me submit to you at this juncture. The word of God is consistent. The word of God is yea and amen. The truth does not change. Ever and that we pass away, but not a dot of the word of God. There is nothing like progressive truth that this truth has progressed and has changed. No, 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 no. The truth of God is perfect. Jesus preached it on the mountain. He preached it on the valley, in the valley. He preached it on the plain. And it is the same truth. That is why you've heard us over and over preaching the word of God and it seems repetitious. Yes, that's why Jesus always said, truly, truly, yeah, repeating it. But a little difference that is there in the sermon preached in Luke chapter 6 is that this blessing was immediately accompanied in verse 24. To 26 by wolves. By wolves. Okay. Causes. In Matthew chapter 5, when he said, Blessing, blessed are you, blessed are you, blessed are you. But in Luke, he was able to say, Woe unto this, unto that, in contrast to the blessings pronouns. And this is just to show that God is God's of blessing, but the contrast to those who will not do what God wants them to do. God is God of love. Who wants to bless you, all of us? But we have to do, we have to be, we have to accept what God wants us to accept, do what God wants us to do, be what God wants us to be. So back to our passage in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 and 12. It's like a teaching, but don't worry, we are going to get there. Each beatitude, and I will tell you why it comes to be called beatitude. Uh, the word beat uh, is from Latin, uh, from four gates, uh, Latin. It was a uh, corner from that Greek word. Uh, which now in our English over the time become beatitude, like list of blessing or list of happiness. So each 
each phrase begins with blessed are. And the word blessed, which is coming uh, from the beard or beatitude, simply means to be happy, to be happy. It translates to rich, deep joy, or simply as it is put, blessed in poorer form. So blessed, many blessings, deep blessings. So what does it mean to be happy? Oh, another word for it is to be fortunate. Uh -huh. To be blessed. Who are the ones that we as human beings regard as the lucky ones or as the blessed one or as the fortunate one? To us, the fortunate ones, the blessed ones are people who have possessions. They have money. They believe that they can afford anything they want. They never worry to pay for their bills or for their needs. There's money. To us, we look at the dangotes of this world and we think, wow, how fortunate he is. We look at Ajima beings of this world, but where is it today? We look at the Sheyima kindes of this world because they have money. I'm talking of money first. We look at big gates of this world. We look at the vessels of this world, the Amazon founder. We look at all these rich people. So some of you, you look at me and say, hey, our pastor is fortunate, he has money. I don't have money, I have Jesus. Glory to God. We think that if they want something, they can have it. They can have beautiful homes. They have nice cars. They can travel for class on the plane. And uh, not as somebody plays it in cattle class. You don't get that. Oh, you are right. Hallelujah. They pack us, pack us like sandings. And the other will be squeezed So, what will be? These people are fortunate. We don't just think that those who have money, those who are rich, those who have possessions are oh, the fortunate ones. To us, human beings, we still think the blessed one, the lucky one, the happy one, the fortunate one, are the pretty ones. Not only those with possession, but those who are pretty. One hour, one day, one Those who are so attractive. Those that everyone wants to be with. Attractive guy, attractive girl, beautiful girl. That's why everybody is now, what do they call? Making up. <laughs> Make up, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> You see our people dressing these days, sometimes say, are you the one? I love to dress pretty, neat, beautiful. But I'm saying, we look at those so-called, uh, uh, what do they call them? Beauty pageant, those, uh, those who do models. <laughs> the models. And you see, they taught all of you, our young girls, how to walk now. Don't get me, I'm not going saying against the board. I'm simply saying we are falling there because we think they are the uh, lucky ones, they are the happy ones, they are the pretty ones. So, they are blessed. <laughs> and they've taught you, young girls, how to, to walk. <laughs> How do you work? Sorry, I broke my mind. <laughs> Catwalk, they call it, right? Glory to God. Amen. 
So to us, we think the beautiful one are the happy ones. See why I want to want to bad that you know I want the Allah will confirm. So to us, as human beings, we think we are blessed when you have possessions, money. We think you are blessed when you are pretty, that is beautiful. We also think that the blessed ones are those with power. Those with power. Those who have access to privilege and statues. Though, of course, riches and Power goes to get, go together. Especially in our African setup. If you have money, you can get to political posts. Post of power. Or if you get to political posts, you become rich. You gain a lot of possession. And embezzle a lot of money. And many of us we look at them and we think, wow, they are blessed. They must be happy. They are the fortunate ones. They are the lucky ones. They are the blessed ones. We look at music stars. We look at the movie stars. We look at the mongoos of this world, business mongoos. And we wish like we are like them. We wonder if we can get there. We wish to get there. Listen to me. Money is good. It's good to be pretty. It's good to have position. But we thought this doesn't mean you will be happy. That's why you have seen a lot of suicide among the celebrities. They are not satisfied. Money does not bring joy. Position does not bring satisfaction. The joy, the happiness of a man is not limited to the amount of possessions that he has. The Bible says so. These are not the true hallmarks of happiness. So Jesus is telling us in a passage this morning, the hallmark. I may be only able to do my introduction a lot today and probably bring one of the uh, beatitudes, the first one. But we are going to take our time. You need to get this right. The yes, blessed so one. Are. That's the, 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 the meaning of the talk, the beatitude. So, the blessed one. So in the Beatitudes, Jesus describes to us those who are happy. The blessed ones. And Jesus turned the ideas of happiness and fortunate upside down. From what we understand. We think that those who are rich are the happy ones. We think that happiness is in riches. But Jesus says that the happy ones are those who are poor in the spirit. We say happiness is not to be sad. But Jesus says those who mourn will be happy. Blessed are those that mourn. Think about that. We say it is the powerful who are happy. Jesus says it is the meek and humble and the merciful and those who are peacemakers who are happy. We say it is those who indulge in whatsoever vice, in whatsoever enjoyment, in whatsoever pleasure the world has to bring, to offer. They are the happy ones. Jesus said it is those who hunger 
and taste after righteousness. Those who are pure in heart, they are the happy ones. We reckon we are happy when we lead a life where everyone thinks we are wonderful and everyone looks up to us. But Jesus said it is those who are persecuted. Those who are reviled. Those who are insulted. Those who are evil spoken of. They are the happy ones. Wow, what a difference. What sort of happiness is this? What sort of blessedness is this that welcomes persecution, that welcomes poverty, that welcomes humility? May I submit to you at this junction that we must remember that God's ways are strange ways. The God's ways are strange to the ways of the world. In Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 and verse 9, Isaiah 55, verse 8 and verse 9, God said, For my thought are not your thought. Neither are your ways my ways. Said the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my way higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Jesus often gives us that things with him is paradoxical. He said, you have to give to her. The word says you get all you can and can all you get. But Jesus said give all you can. That is when you will get all you can. So it's contrary to the idea of the word. Jesus says somewhere that to be a leader, you have to be a servant. That's not the thought of the world. So that is the same thing we are seeing in this passage of the Beatitude. And I'm saying to you that this is the secret to true happiness. To true blessedness. To true riches in Christ. To true joy in the Lord. There are many Beatitudes in this sermon on the morning. There are nine beatitudes. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who do hunger and test after righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemaker. Blessed are those who are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. And as he said, blessed are ye who are reviled. Who are insulted for Christ's sake. So today and for the next few Sundays. I want to begin to share with you the truth of this beatitude. I may take a couple of these each Sunday, but today I will take the first one. And we will pray. I believe God is laying this sermon on my heart for you to tie to the true secret of joy, of blessedness. Blessedness that has eternal value. The force of this beatitude is blessed are the poor in spirit. We look in verse 3. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit. For this in the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be pure in spirit? And he said, this is the kingdom of heaven. Before we speak about this point in the spirit, let me talk a little about the kingdom of heaven. 
In my studies, a lot of issues are raised that the kingdom of heaven is different from the kingdom of God. <laughs> but some people believe it's the same. I believe the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven is also the same, only that one has a literal appearance and the kingdom of God is over all at every time. And you will notice that some of these same sermon were used, for example, in Luke chapter 6 that we read. Are you with me? Go with me to Luke chapter 6, verse 20. Uh, 20. 20. Verse 20. I'm trying to look at which 20. Amen. Amen. What does it say? Are you there? Yes, sir. Uh, read it for me. And he lifted up his eyes. Okay. He lifted up his eyes to the disciple and said, for yours is the kingdom of God. But Matthew said, for yours or theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Somebody put it this way that Matthew, because he was focused on the Jews, we believe that Matthew wrote his gospel with the focus to the Jews. And look to the Gentiles. I don't want to go deep. This is not theological class. Eh? But I'm coming to one thing. That during the days of Matthew, many Jews, they are even afraid to write the name of God or call the name of God or write God, Adonai, as it were. That so that they don't make a mistake or it can become blasphemous. So they always substitute the word God for heaven. That's an idea. And I can, I could quote a lot of places in Matthew that were written as kingdom of heavens and the same uh, 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 there is a word we look in the common gospel. Just keep my mind. But don't let me go too much into that. I don't want to get too spread. But the same storyline was used as kingdom of God. Why Matthew said kingdom of heaven and in Luke or in Mark it was written as kingdom of God. So that was the idea that somebody posted. But for basic definition that I've always understood that the kingdom of God is always present. And it is the rule of God and being under the rule of God every time. But the kingdom of heaven is those specific times like when Jesus will come to establish the reign or where we will appear and stay with God after this world. Whichever way, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, simply speaks of the reign and rule being under the rule and peace and prosperity of God Almighty. So if this appeared to be I'm not going to help, but I'm going to be in the kingdom of heaven in the presence of God, like that song says, that he said, the poor in the spirit. Who are the poor in the spirit? And it also means that I'm always under the rule and the control and the beauty and the blessings of God Almighty. Who are the poor in the spirit? What does it mean to be poor in the spirit? First, nobody wants to be poor. In fact, we are living in a age that church is preaching, laying emphasis only on prosperity. Even some are preaching, some are preaching to mean that when you are poor, you are not a Christian. Or a good Christian. That is not the Bible. Yes, nobody wants to be poor. And I'm talking about physical poverty. 
We want to have, we want to have. But Jesus said, Blessed are the poor. And to be poor simply means, number one, he said, Blessed are the poor in the spirit. This means to be broken hearted. This means to be sorry. This means to be repentant. See, the way to heaven is not through a good life living. It's not through living a good life. We are not going to the kingdom of heaven. We are not going to go to heaven because of the good deeds we do. The way to heaven it is through faith in Jesus Christ. Which begins with a profound awareness of our spiritual poverty. Spiritual poverty. This is what leads us to turn it to Jesus Christ in repentance. I found out that recently the word repentance is what people are running away from. <laughs> Some people believe that the thought of saying you repent is the act of work. No, it is not a work. It is a state of a broken heart, of a sorry heart, of realizing that you are a poor sinner, that you deserve nothing but to go to hell, and you are broken hearted over your sin. Then you understand that you need the grace of God, that you need his undeserved favor and to be saved. I cannot save myself. I am a poor spiritually. This is those who acknowledge their own spiritual poverty. This is the kingdom of heaven. And this is in the present tense. It begins now, not just in the future. We not only need the grace of God to receive salvation. But we also need the grace of God to lead a fruitful Christian life. Many people today in Christian door, if I use that one as it is being used, they are full of spiritual pride. They are not poor in the spirit. You ask them about how they are saved. You begin to hear them saying, nah, because I do this, because I am dead, because I don't sin, because I don't fornicate, mostly they will only list those they know they don't do. But the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, for any to be saved, you must realize that you are a poor person spiritually. You must know that you are a lost sinner, that you are on your way to hellfire, and that you simply need the grace of God to get born again. Those are the poor in the spirit. Those who are broken at it for their sin. Those who are not, they know they, they are dirty. And they only need grace of God to become pure. I remember when Isaiah was brought before the presence of God Almighty to human value, to human, to human grade. We will say Isaiah is a good man. Great man. Holy man. But when Isaiah got before the holy throne of God, he said, Woe unto me. I am of clean leaves. I am a sinner. I am Lord. Living among sinners. What a statement of broken heart. And what did God do? The Bible said God sent an angel to take a coal from the throne and touch him. The work of salvation is always of God. Oh! 
The work of salvation is always the work of God. And for you to be a possessor of that salvation, you need to be broken at it. We have to be careful of easy believers. When people just receive Jesus Christ without repenting their sin, without knowing that their sin is terrible and grievous, and it caused the life of the Son of God who shared his life on the cross of Calvary. Broken hearted. The Apostle Paul said in all his pursuit of righteousness that he himself was the chief of sinner. Apostle, said this Apostle is a true saying and worthy of acceptance. That Jesus saved sinners of whom I am the chief. That is bringing yourself down. See, poverty means you depend on something. For physical poverty means you need it. It's like beggar. Without your goodwill, I cannot hit. So somebody who is poor in the spirit, if somebody is slapped like beggar, knowing that without the good will of God, they cannot be in the kingdom of heaven. They cannot be part of God's kingdom. I ask you this morning, has there been a time in your life that you see yourself as a sinner? That you truly came before God Almighty? And say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I am a sinner. I am a sinner. Please save me. The woman at the world realized her spiritual poverty. See, we, we, are, we as human beings, we are totally depraved. That means that sin has depraved us. Sin has wrecked us. We are spiritually bankrupt. We need the help of God. We need God to save us by His grace. Total depravity means, does not mean that we are bad as we can be. It means that there is not even one point where we measure up to God's holiness. Isaiah put it this way. Say for all thy righteousness, all thy righteousnesses are like filthy rag. The best you can do is dirty before God. It's not measured to God. The holiness of God is so great. It's so powerful. It's so blinding. For you to now become holy, declare holy, is to become poor in the spirit. Broken hearted. That's what poor in the spirit is. I say bless is the man who recognizes he is a sinner. I say God is pure. God is blameless. God is perfect in holiness. When we view ourselves in the light of our of God, our spiritual poverty is made known. Sometimes when we look around the room, it looks clean. It looks clean. Let's say in a room it's been swept, it looks clean everywhere just But if you open a window where the ray of sun shines in, and you are looking at it today, you will see some dust particle in the air. No matter how clean we think we are on our own, we still have the dust particle. And we need to recognize that. And always go before the Lord who is holy and perfect and mighty and say, Lord, I am a sinner. I do not deserve any good thing. I only pray for your mercy. 
I pray for your grace. I pray for your favor. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. For by faith, for by grace are you saved. Through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That is poor in the spirit. I've heard many people have asked this question. If you are to die today, do you know for sure you are going to heaven? And I've heard a lot of different answers. Mostly they will say yes. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not bad. I don't think evil to other people. I try to be nice. I stay out. So you are saying you are not a sinner? I found some who had the audacity, audacity to say I'm not a sinner. That's spiritual pride. They do not possess what is called spiritual poverty. Broken at it. I know that you do not deserve anything good for God, even not for His grace. I submit you to you today. I am not good. But God is good. I am not great. God is great. I am not holy. God is holy. I'm not perfect. God is perfect. But glory to God. The true faith in Lord Jesus Christ. God has imputed on me His righteousness. God has implanted in me His holiness. Today I am holy because I have the holiness of Christ. Today I am perfect because I have the perfection of Christ. That is poor in the spirit. All glory to God. I have nothing to share in Him. All my goodness today. Any good thing in me is the Lord. And that leads me to the second point. That to be poor in the spirit is not only to be broken at But this signifies that you are being humble. It's to be humble. It's being humble. It speaks of being humble. We read the story in Luke chapter 18. Verse 9 to verse 14. It is the story of the Pharisee and the publican. I read for you. He said, and it's this po- Jesus is the one speaking it. So the Bible says, and Jesus, he spake this parable unto Satan. Listen to this. Which trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Think about that. Those who are not poor in the spirit. And they despise others. And Jesus went on with this story. He said, two men went up into the temple to pray. The one, a Pharisee, and the one, the other, a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not like other men. <laughs> ah, they are extortioners, unjust, and adulterers. I'm not like even this publican. Look at him. Sinner. Hmm. You know, God, I fast twice a week. <laughs> I give tithes of all I possess. Wow. Sad. Some of you, you come with that heart before God. You think God will bless you. <laughs> Your best righteousness is a filthy rock. All my goodness is stem from God. Who? But listen to this. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much his eyes unto heaven but smooth his breast. Amen. Say, God be merciful to me, sinner. God, have mercy on me. Lord, I need your grace. Lord, I need your help. Lord, I am nothing. Lord, I am poor. Oh, God, be merciful on me. 
Jesus said, I tell you, this man, the publican, went home, went down to his house, justified, Amen. rather than the other, the publican. Listen to the closeness close of this other passage. He said, For everyone that exalted himself mm. shall be abased. And he that humbled himself shall be exalted. Being poor in the spirit is being humble. Even after you are saved, now that you are born again, stop bragging on your spirituality. I am still poor in the spirit. I want to be a Christian more in my heart. I always need the help of God. I'm not praying enough. I'm not reading the Bible enough. I'm not living to the right standard I ought to live. I'm not giving enough. I'm not serving God enough. Lord, I need your help. Stop being a Pharisee. I fast twice a week. I am not like them. Many people's spiritual pride is killing them. Even those who are prophets, Jesus has saved the spiritual pride is killing them. The spiritual pride not killing you. Do you see yourself as a righteous man on your own? If so, you will miss and you are missing the blessings of God. Blessed are the poor in the spirit. Blessed are those are you when you recognize that you are spiritually bankrupt. We are spiritually poor. But God is spiritually rich. God is righteous. And His only Son, Jesus Christ, is righteous. It was said that He knew no sin. But it became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. When we recognize our spiritual poverty, though it's painful, it breaks our heart. But it's a blessing. It is when we see our need for a savior and recognize our need to trust Christ as our holy hope. Spiritual poverty gives us a dissatisfaction that can be satisfied only in Christ. There is something awesome when we see ourselves for what we really have. And what is that? Sinners. Election. Lost. Otoshi. Pathetic. On our way to hell. But glory to God. Glory to God. That I'm not going to hell. Not because of my righteousness. I'm not going to hell. Not because of my goodness. I'm not going to hell. Not because of my goodness. Of my holiness. But I'm not going to hell. Because as a poor sinner. I went to Jesus Christ. I asked him to save me. I told him, Jesus, I am sorry. I am a sinner. All I deserve is hell. But the word of God has made it clear to me that you have become the sacrifice for my sins. You shed your blood for the remission of my sins. And you have brought for me, your eternal life. Jesus, Jesus, I reset this. That you are my Savior. I accept it. your sacrifice. Jesus saved my soul. Give me your eternal life. And that's glorious day, I remember. I gloriously got saved. Blessed are the poor in the spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of God. 
Are you here this morning? Are you poor in the spirit? Have you ever come to Jesus Christ? For that cleansing blood? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you saved? Have you asked him for salvation? That you are poor in the spirit. You are broken hearted for your sin. Repentant for your sin. And you are humbled by this realization. You are not looking down on others. Let me close with something that happened in this community. It's not a perfect illustration. I remember when we started this church some 16 years ago. And we have people who are coming, who have been here, they are still here, part of our foundation members. But there was this particular family, they are still in this neighborhood, they are not part of our church. But they feel that because of the church they are going, that they are more spiritual, they are this, they are that. And I remember I've caught them, especially the matern of that family, looking down on one of our members and looking at hey, these people, they are not spiritual. And I know a lot of Christians today that think because of the church they go, that is why they are more spiritual. You ask them if they say, yeah, don't you know, I go to so, so, so church. Can, do you even, if you think right, if your head is correct, do you need to ask me if I'm a Christian once I told you the church I'm going? Indirectly, that's what they are saying. Some people say, I told you I'm reverend, doctor, Theology and emeritus, theology and honorable. What do you know? See, I can tear the Bible into pieces and feed you. All those are still pride of the spirit. I don't know it all. I don't even know anything. Jesus is one who knows it all. And it is his knowledge. I am not good. He is the one that is good. That family I was talking about, down the road, their children started having pregnancy out of wedlock, giving impregnate boys, their boys impregnated people out of wedlock. Where is that spirituality? See, spiritual pride has destroyed a lot of people. But happy are you. Blessed are you who are the poor in spirit. For yours is the kingdom of heaven. To be saved, you need to first be poor in the spirit. Broken at it. I'm being humble. Asking God for help to save you. And for Christian living too. Never believe that you have attained. Paul said, I have not attained. This thing I do, this one thing I do, forgetting the past. I walk, I pray toward the man of the high calling of Christ. That is a spirit that says that I am nothing. God is everything. I rely on Jesus. Glory to God. I'm not going to hell today. I'm going to heaven because I've been saved by the grace of God. I recognize that I'm poor in this I'm broken hearted for my sin. And I always pray God to help me to be humble. Live for his glory. Glory to God. I want praise quarter to come again. You sing that song. Invitation. Be coming while I pray. The coming while I pray. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Father, I want you to stand up. They are going to sing that old song. And if God has touched your heart, you can come. If I were you, you need to be poor in spirit, broken at it, be humble. Come before God, come to the altar, and pray to God Almighty to help you declare your poverty of the spirit. Express your broken heart. Be like that publican who said, God, be merciful. Me. I need the mercy of God. Glory to God. Let me pray with you. Father, I thank you today. Bless us as we worship this invitation time with this song. And as your people come to the altar to pray, pray that the Holy Spirit will deal with every heart this morning. Amen. And help us, O Lord, to be broken-hearted. Amen. To be humble. Amen. To be of poor, to be poor in the spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father. Amen. The beautiful ones, the blessed ones. I want to remain part of it. Help me, Lord. Amen. Help us, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.